For me, discipleship takes on many forms. It can be a growth group. Uh, here at Shoreline, one of the things they offer is a men's uh, Bible study group that I love to be a part of. Uh, we get together on Tuesday mornings, meet with Pastor Dennis, and uh, uh, open up the Bible and read it and share it together. Um, and, and that's great, and it's, it's great to get in the Word and study it, but the, the real growth, I think, comes from coming alongside each other and, um, and helping each other and encouraging each other. And we'll talk about things as, as fathers and as husbands, that needs that we have and hurts that we have for, uh, either our, in our relationship with God or our relationship with our spouse or our relationship with our children. And uh, just to be able to come alongside each other and encourage each other and build each other up and, and uh, let you know that you're not alone, uh, that's a huge part of growth and discipleship. Uh, I'm sitting in a room full of men who are far more uh, experienced. Uh, there's a retired pastor in there, uh, and uh, he has this incredible wealth of knowledge of the Old Testament because his focus in his ministry was bringing Jews to Jesus. Uh, so when topics come up, he draws in that for us, and, and wow, what a wealth. There's another gentleman who's just extremely well-read. Uh, and again, he shares uh, not only the, the, the Bible, which he quotes verbatim very well, but also many books and commentaries that he's read over the years. And again, so I get to sit there and soak up and, and, and bounce ideas and uh, knowledge with these guys, and it's fantastic. So. Whether you're the discipler or the disciple, we're all growing, and that's the great part of discipleship. It's the idea that you're all in versus standing on the shore and just looking out. And so if you're standing on the shore and looking out, the ocean is beautiful. But if you're in the water with your face down in, it's a whole other world, a whole different experience. Uh, it's much deeper, it's much more enriching. And uh, for me, that's what discipleship does. It's, it's, it allows me to be all in. They've heard the words, I now pronounce you husband and wife, you may kiss the bride. They kissed, probably not for the first time. Uh, they stood before family and friends and God and declared their vows to each other. They had the cake, they had the reception afterwards. They've gone on a honeymoon, and now they're back home again. And they look at each other, and they say, well, that's it. We're married. We're done. Right? Right? Wrong. They're just getting started, baby. <laughs> I mean, you're just at that point, you're just learning. You're just kicking it off. And any idea, any thought... That now that we, okay, you know, okay, we had the cake, check, uh, threw the bouquet, check, uh, got the, you know, got pictures taken, check. You know, and, okay, now it's done. Any thought that they're done misses the point completely. Now, they are, they are married. Yes. But would you, would you say there might be more coming down the road? What's the answer? Yes. She lays there, drenched in sweat. She's been going like this. He, he, who, he, he, who, which I hear takes all the pain away. Um, you know, through, through the labor, she's come to the moment where the doctor says, okay, now you can push. The baby has breathed the air of this world, has kind of weighed, the skin's checked, wiped down, and that baby is placed in her arms. And she lays there holding this baby, looking at this little face. And she says to herself, oh, I'm done. Right? She's done. Right? What's the answer? No, she's just getting started. I mean, it's just, it's just, she's just getting started. It's a whole adventure, a whole learning curve, a whole, can I say, a whole life now of being a mom. He walks across the stage 
to pomp and circumstance. Anybody remember that one? Da, 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 da. Remember that? The graduate. He, he's come across the stage. He's taken the tassel. He's wearing a silly robe that nobody would ever wear in any other situation and a silly hat that who came up with that? And he's crossed the stage. He's taken the tassel. He's put it to the other side. He's shaken the hand of some dignitary. He's been given a scroll, a diploma. He's gone through commencement, and he says, I've arrived. Right? No, he's just what? Getting started. Now you got to find a job. Now you got to live your life. There's these moments in life where you can feel like, I've got there, but when you realize that when you get there, you're just starting a whole new adventure. That's the Christian faith. That is the Christian faith. That's the greatest story ever. We talked last week about salvation. And Pastor Steve mentioned that in the last calendar year, 157 people just in worship services at Shoreline have said for the first time, I believe in Jesus. I call on his name. And, and, and so from the standpoint of heaven, God the Father, God the Father made a way for salvation. God the Father so loved the world and was so filled with grace that he made a way. And God the Father wants us to not just to know salvation, he wants us to know the journey of walking with Jesus. That's the heart of the Father. It's not just that we have our sins washed away, not just that we can say we're saved and now I'm done, but God the Father sent his only son Jesus not just to die on the cross for our sins, he did, not, not just to, to wash all of our wrongs away and give us new life. Jesus did that. And when you come to the cross and confess your sins and accept Jesus, you have new life. You are a Christian. But any thought of saying, the moment you receive Jesus, that point of salvation, any thought of saying, I'm done now, we miss the point. When you come to the cross and receive Jesus Christ, listen closely, you're just getting started. You're just beginning. I remember sitting with a guy named Rudy after about months of talking and praying and he was reading through the Gospel of John. We were studying it together. He was talking about the Christian faith and he grew up in a totally non-Christian home like I did with no faith and he was thinking about becoming a Christian. And I remember saying to Rudy one week, I said, Rudy, we've been studying together and talking. I said, Rudy, are you ready to become a Christian yet? Are you ready to, to confess your sin and receive Jesus and start to walk with Jesus? And here, this was his response, totally seriously. He says, he says I don't know, Pastor. He says, this is the biggest decision of my life. He said, this is bigger than getting married. This is bigger than having kids. This is my whole life. And I thought, he gets it. He understands that faith isn't just about saying, I believe in Jesus, now I'm done, any more than having a child is about delivering a baby and saying, I'm done. But when the Holy Spirit of God fills us, we begin this journey called discipleship. Discipleship. What is discipleship? Discipleship is about walking with Jesus, following Jesus. And it happens with the power of the Holy Spirit of, the, of God living in us so that every day, listen closely, for the rest of our lives, we're walking on that journey. Yes, at the cross, you become a Christian. But there's more. Just like at the altar, a man and a woman become husband and wife. But there's more. And I think some people feel like if I just came to the cross and prayed the prayer, I got in the Jesus club, you know, I got in the Jesus club, now I'm a Christian, and I'm done. Just kind of, okay, Jesus, when you come back again someday, when I go to heaven, we'll, we'll, take, we'll pick it up from there. No, no. Coming to the cross and receiving Jesus is commencement. But now you commence forward in a whole new life. And that life is really about being like Jesus. I want to ask this question. What is a disciple? What does it mean to be a disciple? The word disciple really means a follower. But let me give you a simple definition. A disciple of Jesus is a person who has confessed their sin and accepted the grace of Jesus. That's the moment of salvation. This is also a person who seeks to walk in the steps of Jesus every day in what they think and feel and say and do all of life. Becoming a Christian is the starting point. It's the launch pad into, I believe, with all my heart, the most glorious, wonderful, beautiful, powerful, meaningful experience any human being can ever have. Because from that moment on, the Holy Spirit of God moves in you, and now you get to walk with Jesus, becoming more like him with every passing day. 
Some years ago, people were wearing bracelets that said, now we're wearing Fitbits, which is you know, a nice thing. I had a Fitbit watch on here, but people were wearing bracelets that said WWJD. And the first three words that that represented was, what would Jesus, the third word was, anybody remember? What would Jesus do? And, and now I'm gonna do it, we're gonna play, I, I was thinking, and I, that's a great question. A disciple, a follower of Jesus, is asking that question. You don't have to have a bracelet. They're asking the question, what would Jesus do in this situation? But I, I got thinking, if I were to you know, kind of promote this wristband-wearing culture, what else could we put on wristbands that would help us as disciples? And, and so, so here's, here's a second option that we can make on these wristbands. WWJT. WWJT. Now, if you want to whisper to the person next to you what you think the answer is, what, do you think that, what does that represent? For me, it's what would Jesus think? What would Jesus think? I, I, the way we think affects everything. What would Jesus think about this situation? What would Jesus think about what I'm about to do? What would Jesus, and we're asking those, what would Jesus think? I want to learn to think like Jesus. That's what a disciple does. So, so here's what you do. You put on your WWJD bracelet. Then you put on your, your WWJT bracelet. We're going to have lots of bracelets today, okay? Then how about this bracelet? WWJS. What would Jesus say? There's a lot of things I think about saying and some things I would say that I don't think Jesus would ever say. And a disciple is letting their words be formed by Jesus. Would I say this to my spouse? Would I say it that way with that edge? Would I say this to my child? Would I say this to my friend? Would I say this about that person? Would I say this about that, that person in, in politics or in the arts or that person in media? Would I say those things? Would Jesus say those things? And we start to actually... What would Jesus do? What would Jesus think? Now we got three bracelets on. So I'm going to make these, I'm going to make a lot of money. Okay, everyone's going to be wearing like 20 bracelets. Okay, here's the fourth bracelet. You ready? Here's my fourth one. W-W-J-G. But the first W isn't what? Oh. So you're, you're on, you're on it here. Where would Jesus go? Where would Jesus go? It'll amaze you. If you've been reading the Gospel of Matthew, we've been reading it this last week, and some of you are following the sermon. So if you read Matthew last week or this week, you're going to see Jesus went places that surprised people. But if I said, where would Jesus go? Now here's the last one. If you get this one, I'm going to have a little prize. Come up afterwards, you're going to get a prize. I'm going to give you a hug, okay? This is going to be exciting. Huge motivation. Huge motivation, right? Okay, here we go. H-W-J-S-H-S-T. Okay, now put that on the bracelet. Anybody, just real quick, off the top of your head. Oh, how would Jesus share his story today? Good. No, that's not right, though. Um, but that was a great, but, but, but you know what? That's what your bracelet's going to be. I'm making that bracelet. No. Okay, here's what I came up with. How would Jesus spend his spare time? Have you ever thought about your spare time? What would Jesus do if he had spare time? I'm going to sit for eight hours and watch TV. I don't know if that, maybe. Uh, but, but maybe Jesus would say, maybe I'll take three or four of those hours and go to a homeless shelter and help out. Or volunteer with some kids in the church. How would Jesus spend his spare time? So, so we're going to come up with like 100 bracelets. No, the, here's the whole point. We don't need bracelets. We just need to be more like Jesus. That A disciple is someone who's come to the cross, who's received Jesus Christ, they've confessed their sin, they become his follower, and now they spend the rest of their life filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God the Spirit moves into us, and we live our days saying, how can I be more the person Jesus wants me to be? And it is the best life imaginable. Because when you begin to speak more like Jesus, it changes your relationships. When you begin to think more like Jesus, the old thought patterns begin to kind of die off. And a whole new way of thinking comes into your heart. And your life. When you begin to leverage your time according to what Jesus would have you do. So, so how, do I know, how do I know what Jesus will think and what he would he'd do and how he would have me respond to things? I want to share four things today, four things that will help you grow as a disciple. Now, I went through the Gospel of Matthew, and I was looking for all these different things, and there's, there's dozens of things that a disciple does, the way a disciple lives. I picked four that I think are four really big ones, four really important ones, of many, many, many options. But I want to challenge you today, if you've come to the cross and received Jesus, you would no longer think at all, okay, I did it, I'm done. Any more than delivering a baby is the end of raising a child. Or any more than saying, I do, is the end of being married. Or any more than commencement is the end of your career. Those are all starting points. And if we would look at every day as a continuing of that journey, 
of living for Jesus, if we would be his followers, his disciples, I believe that God's people would change the world with his love and his grace and his truth and his kindness and his hands of service. So I'm gonna pray and then I wanna just share four thoughts with you about what it looks like to walk as a disciple. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. For anyone who's here today who's come to the cross and received you, Jesus, whether it was, was part of the group that did this last Sunday or whether it's somebody who received you, Jesus, decades ago, would you spark in our hearts a greater desire to walk with you, to live for you, to be your follower, to be like you, Jesus. And through us, would you bring your love and your care and your compassion and your goodness to this world that so desperately needs to know that, Jesus, you're still alive. You are risen and you're at work in your people. So speak to each one of us, including me, this morning. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, note takers, you're going to see there's a place to write down five things in your notes there. If you want to use that, that's great. I'll get to the fifth one. I'm going to focus on the first four and just touch on the fifth one. So here's the first one. A disciple follows Jesus, walks in his footsteps. This is what a disciple does. A disciple follows Jesus, says, where does Jesus go? How does Jesus function? So the fundamental, basic concept of discipleship is I am following Jesus. And you say, well, Jesus isn't walking on the earth right now like he did with the original disciples. How can I follow him? It's by knowing his life and his heart and walking and living and loving in the way that he would. And this is how it began with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, we read this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Listen to these words. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Come follow me. And they followed him. Come follow me. They left their nets. They left their career. They left their family. They followed Jesus. Now, not everyone has to leave everything in that way. But the idea is simply this. Jesus said, this is what discipleship is. It's following me. And understand, in the ancient world, In the ancient world, the idea of sort of walking in the footsteps of a rabbi was like one of the highest callings. And when somebody became a disciple of a rabbi, and Jesus was a rabbi, he was a a teacher, he also was God with us, but they were just learning that and exploring that. But when Jesus said, come follow me, it literally meant that where Jesus walked and where Jesus went, they would literally follow him. They would walk with him. They would share life with him. And this was sort of college in those days. They, 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 you know, our, our idea of, of universities and all that is, is a Western form of education that's fairly, fairly new in the history of the world. For, so often it was mentoring, it was, it was discipling, it was people walking with other people and learning a trade or learning life. Well, Jesus was teaching them life. And so they, they began this process for th- over three years of just walking with Jesus and following him. And, and that hasn't changed. Th- that's the way life is to be lived today. Every day, as we're walking, saying, oh, what would Jesus do? And how would Jesus think? Would that change my thinking? And where would Jesus go? And what would Jesus say? And how would Jesus spend his spare time? And how would you, and just, and thinking about it. And being in the scriptures and knowing the life of Jesus enough, knowing the heart of God enough. And and can I tell you something? Anytime somebody says, well, I couldn't, I don't really couldn't know exactly how Jesus would respond to that. I just don't really know. There's so much we know about Jesus and how he loved and how he cared. That if we would just work at the things that are simple and obvious, that would take us a lifetime. I mean, there's, there's so many clear things that Jesus spoke and taught. If you've been doing the reading with us in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount. Just take the Sermon on the Mount and linger there for about 10 years. And work on the things there. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Where Jesus is teaching and instructing. We'll get to teaching in just a moment. But, but the, this idea of people leaving behind and following, following a rabbi, following a teacher, and becoming a disciple was common in the world at that time. But this is Jesus' way for us today. So to look and say, am, am I committed to day by day walking and following in the ways of Jesus? And, and here's my invitation to you. 
And this, this would be, I think, a great experiment for every person here and every person online and every person in the family worship center. <clears throat> Here's the invitation to Jesus-honoring discipleship. Will you enter an experiment of trying to follow Jesus as you walk through a normal day? This is my challenge. Pick one day in the coming week and actually put it on your calendar and just say, today I'm going to do an experiment. I'm going to try to follow Jesus in everything I do. Each word I speak, each thought I think. And it's not that hard. You'll be something going through your mind. I can't believe they, and they should, and I just wish, and I don't think Jesus would think that way. And you have to go through this process of saying, that's not, that's not, okay, Jesus, how would you think? How would you respond to this person? Someone cut you off in traffic. You say, what might I say? I might say, I bet they're having a rough day. My, my wife, my wife, I should talk about another couple that says it relates to, no, my wife and I, when, we, when I drive, I can get frustrated with people. So somebody cuts you off and does something crazy on the road. And my first response is to get frustrated. And, I, and actually, Sherry told me as our kids were growing up, you can't use the I word in the car when the kids are around. You know the I word? Now you said it, not me. See, I didn't say it, honey. See, I did that, honey. I didn't, I didn't say it. Um, but I get really mad at someone, and I would use the I word. And it's not a nice word. And Sherry said, don't say that in front of the kids. But you know what her thoughts were? Maybe, um, maybe he just found out that his wife's going to have a baby and he's hurrying home to get to her. Or maybe, and she thinks about maybe he had something happen in his life. That was, and she'd have all these scenarios of compassion. I'd be like, what's wrong with this person? Is, am I the only one or can anybody else, some, anybody? Okay, thank you. Okay, praise the Lord. I see that hand, brother. I see that hand, sister. So, um, but, but this is the journey of discipleship. How, what would Jesus say right now? I don't think he would, Jesus would say a lot of things that I say. Can I just be your pastor and tell you that? There's times things that come out of my mouth. I'm like, I don't think Jesus would say that. I don't want to be that person. I want to be more like Jesus. And it's, it's a lifetime of learning. Here's your challenge. This coming week, pick one day. And, all, and, and I'm not saying put on five different bracelets to ask you, know, but just do something that will remind you through the day. And just, you get up in the morning, you're going to interact with your kids. What would Jesus say right now? I think he'd linger a little bit longer than the way I dash out the door. I think he might sit down and look at them face to face because he kind of with little kids, they were always saying, don't bug them with the little kids, but he'd say, oh, let the little kids come to me. And, and just through the whole day, what would Jesus do? What would he say? What would he think? How would Jesus respond to this? How would Jesus spend his spare time? And just one day, try it. And I think at the end of the day, you would look back and go, that was one of the best days of my life. And then try it another day. A disciple follows in the footsteps of Jesus. Number two. A disciple listens and learns, has an open heart. A disciple listens and learns and has an open heart. Jesus was so clear that if we're going to follow him, we have to listen to his words. We have to understand what this book, the Bible, says and try to follow what it says. So in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching and teaching about all kinds of topics. He's talking about, you've heard that it was said, don't murder. But I tell you, don't even be angry with people. Don't hold bitterness in your heart. He just talks about generosity and sharing. He talks about praying and what prayer is. He talks about forgiveness and grace. He teaches and teaches on topic after topic after topic. And at the end of his whole teaching time, he says this. Therefore, this is Matthew 7, 24 and following. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, does them, right? It's like a wise man, a wise woman. It's a wise person who's built his house on the rock. Now listen to this. Here's their house. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now watch how the story changes. Verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice... It's like a foolish man, a foolish woman, a foolish person who built their house on sand. And when the rain came down and when the streams rose, when the winds blew and beat against that house, it fell with a great crash. The only thing different in these two little stories is the foundation. In both stories, the rain falls. That's life. In both stories, the floodwaters come up. That's life. In both stories, the wind pounds against the house. That's life. In one story, the house stands. And in one story, the house falls. 
The only difference is the foundation. And what is the foundation Jesus is talking about? One person has heard the words of Jesus and put them into effect. They try to live the way of Jesus. And in one story, the person has heard the words of Jesus, but they don't do anything with it. The second thing I want us to think about, and what it means to be a disciple and to walk with Jesus, is to know the word of God and to follow it, to know this book. There's been no time in the history of the world that the Bible has been more available. And I suspect there's probably been no time in the history of the world per capita of less people reading it. You could pull up on your phone and get a free Bible app. Get the U version, free Bible app. And it gives you like 100 versions, you know, 100 different, you know, and it's got resources and tools. It's right there on your phone. It's right there on your tablet, on your computer. You can, you know, we, we, it's so available. But we have to read it and live it. And, and so that's the second challenge is to really think about what does it mean to not only know what God's word says, but to live it out. Here's an invitation to Jesus-honoring discipleship. Will you read the Bible daily and seek to discern the meaning, its meaning, and live the truth? Will you every day say, I'm going to open the Bible and read it? Even if it's, if it's two or three verses, or one or two chapters, or like we're doing right now, where it's, where it's a whole chunk of chapters, a whole bunch of pages. But, but, but every day, will you say, God, and if you don't have a Bible, anybody, you go by our Connection Center, we will, we will, part of your offering money goes to make sure that anybody who ever wants a Bible, English, Spanish, and if we have other languages, we'll get those too. We want to get the Bible in people's hands. Every day to read it and to say, okay, what does this mean for my life? How does this shape who I am? When I became a Christian, I was 15, almost 16 years old, grew up in a non-churched home, had never held a Bible in my hands. And somebody gave me this big, thick, hard-bound Bible, uh, Harper Study Bible, Revised Standard Version, uh, and, they get, and they said, this is God's word, you're supposed to read it. So I started reading it. And there's a lot of stuff I didn't understand. I was 16 years old. I'd never been around church. I'd never been to Sunday school or any of that. But the stuff I did understand, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I didn't get it. I'm, can I confess something as a pastor right now? There's still stuff in the Bible I don't totally understand. It's a big book from the ancient world, but it's God's word. So every day to read this book and try to live it out, what can I take from that today? And you'll watch that transform. You will become more like Jesus. You'll be transformed more into his image. Number three, a disciple sacrifices on many levels. To follow Jesus, to be his disciple, means that I make that so important in my life, so critical and central in my life, that there's some things I'm going to go, you know what, that just doesn't matter so much anymore. And we'll give things up and we'll sacrifice things for the sake of Jesus. Jesus tells these two little stories, these two beautiful stories that kind of bring this alive. In, in Matthew 13, verses 44 to 46, here's the first little story. The kingdom of heaven, meaning the kingdom of God, God's way, the way of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again in that same field. And then in, uh, in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Ancient world, if something was in the ground of a field and you owned the field, you owned what was ever in the field. And back then, there were not banks in the way there are now in the same way. And so often people would take what they had and they'd hide it, they'd bury it. So, so this person came along, found in this field that didn't belong to him, this treasure. Covered it over really quick, <laughs> pat it down, throw some straw around so nobody else sees it, right? Goes, says, what's it cost to buy that field? It costs you everything you own. But you know what this person knows? What's buried in that field is worth infinitely more than what they own. So they sell everything and they buy the field and they get the treasure. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, when you know who I am, when you know the treasure of my love and my grace and my power and my presence, and my Holy Spirit in you, you would sell and give up anything and everything to have me. That's how valuable Jesus is. Then he tells another story very, very similar. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he, when he has found one of great value, this pearl of great value, pearl of great price, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Same lesson. If you understand the love of Jesus and the things of God and the, the presence of Jesus in your life, you will understand that it's more valuable than everything else. And here's what happens then. You look at everything else you have and you say, these are great gifts, but they don't own you anymore. Because you understand that what's most valuable is Jesus and his kingdom and his will and his power in your life. And listen closely. Everything else doesn't just become second place. It becomes a distant second. 
And then sacrificing and generosity and sharing and helping and caring to get really easy. Why? Because you have the field and you have the treasure. You have the pearl. You, ha- you have, oh, listen, more than any treasure to field, more than any string of pearls, Jesus. You have Jesus. And he's everything. And everything else takes new perspective. So here's, here's the challenge. Here's the invitation to Jesus honoring discipleship. Will you identify one simple sacrifice you can make for Jesus in the coming week and then lay it down? Will you think of what, what's one thing that I'm clinging to, that I hold to, one thing, and, and, and just lay it. It could be a sacrifice of your pride and asking someone to forgive you for something wrong, but sacrifice that position, that pride. It could be your time that God calls you to sacrifice. It could be a material thing that God calls you to sacrifice. It could be, I, I don't know what it is for you. That's between you and Jesus. But would you say, Jesus, you, I value you so much, you matter so much to me that everything else could be easily laid down. Because I have Jesus. That's discipleship. And the more you understand the value of Jesus and his love for you. I mean, when you know Jesus, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, when you come to God through faith in Jesus, when you become his follower, he says God gives you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We don't, we're, we're just getting glimpses of that now. But there will be a day when our eyes will be unveiled and we will see Jesus face to face. And we'll we'll just say, I had no idea of the goodness and the glory and the love and the blessings you have in store for me. But we get glimpses now when we follow Jesus and we're willing to lay things down for his sake. And then finally, a disciple shares the good news. A disciple shares the good news when you understand the good news and the love of God. And when you understand that knowing Jesus transforms all of your life and fills you with a joy and a hope and a meaning, you want other people to know. Jesus understood this in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, we read this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He says, Lord, he says, says, we should pray, Lord, send people out into the harvest field. Send people out to find those, those lost and wandering sheep. When Jesus looked at you and me before we knew his love and grace, he saw us like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus is the great shepherd. And he said, I love you. And I long for you to come home and to be safe and protected and under my care and provided for and to come by still waters. And and Jesus, that's the longing of Jesus' heart. And listen closely, when we're filled with the Holy, when we come to the cross and receive Jesus, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, and when we walk with Jesus day by day, we become more like him, we think like him, we behave like him. Now listen closely, theologically, we don't become Jesus, we don't become God. We're we're people, we're made in the image of God, but we're just, we're people. But we become people who are ambassadors of Jesus. And Jesus cares for lost sheep. And, And so here's my final challenge to you today. An invitation to Jesus honoring discipleship. Will you pray about one person you can walk with, encourage, and help on their journey toward Jesus or on their journey with Jesus? Will you think of who's that one person who may still be a lost sheep? I'm going to be spending time with family uh, this coming weekend. It's my dad's 80th birthday. All the, all the kids, the five kids are going to be together from different parts of the country. We'll be with my dad and my extended family. And in my extended family, there's still a lot of lost sheep. And I, and I can't say, oh, it doesn't matter to me. Because in me is growing the heart of Jesus. And he loves every lost sheep. He loved me when I was a lost sheep, and he loves me now. And I want my family members, and I'm not going to give you names, but I want my family members, and I can just in the picture of my mind, I can see different family members, and they're so far from Jesus, and he loves them so much. And part of being his disciple is that I love them too. And I pray for them. And I share with them when it's appropriate. And I say, God, let me walk with them. Some of you are grandparents. Walk with your grandkids towards Jesus. Pray for your grandkids every day. 
to love Jesus in this crazy world they're going to grow up in. Pray for God to watch over them. Tell your grandkids stories of faith. Some of your parents, your kids are a mission field. The world is going to be pulling on them and tugging in them and inviting them to all kinds of stuff, and you walk with them towards Jesus. That's your mission field. In your workplace, there's people that are lost sheep. In your neighborhood, there's people that are lost sheep. A disciple cares about people like Jesus does. So start praying for at least one person in your life that's still far from Jesus and say, God, how can I love them? How can I show your love and your grace? Can I invite them to something where they're gonna hear about Jesus? God, can I maybe someday share about my faith a little bit? This is what disciples do. When a woman delivers a baby, the adventure has just begun. (laughs) When a man and a woman say, till death do us part, as long as we both shall live, it's just starting. When someone crosses the stage, commencement, a whole new world is opening up to them. And when we come to the cross and receive the grace of Jesus, it's the end of our old life and our old way of living, but it's the beginning of a new adventure. And there is nothing more exciting and glorious than the journey of growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So live in that this week and see what God does in you and watch what God will do through you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you made a way for us to come home. Thank you that you love us, that you opened up eternity for us. But thank you, Jesus, that by your spirit, you're with us today. You're in us and you're with us and you call us to live in a new way. And Jesus, we don't need a bracelet with a bunch of consonants to remind us. We have your Holy Spirit in our soul and our spirit. So I pray this week, we will live more like Jesus, look more like Jesus, speak more like Jesus, think more like Jesus, love more like Jesus, sacrifice more like Jesus. And the world will see, oh God, that you love every single lost sheep that still wanders. And everyone, every sheep who's come home, let us extend that love to others freely, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.